So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming through. Um, I'm Nick Pentreath, and this is Brian Cutler. And today we'll be talking about uh, parallelizing cross-validation uh, in Spark ML. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I'm a principal engineer at IBM working in the Code A team, which is a center for open source data and AI technologies. I focus on machine learning and AI, and I'm an Apache Spark committer and PMC member. Hi, I'm Brian Cutler. I'm a software engineer at IBM Code A. I'm also an Apache Spark committer and an Apache Arrow committer. I work primarily in open source software. And uh, feel free to ping me at GitHub and with any questions or if you have a uh, code review to do. Uh, so just a little bit about Code A. Um, when I joined uh, the IBM team uh, a little over two years ago, it was known as the Spark Technology Center. And the mission was really around um, Apache Spark and the surrounding ecosystem. So since then, the team has, has been rebranded to uh, Code A. Uh, and the aim is to simplify the end-to-end -end enterprise uh, AI and deep learning lifecycle and workflow. So this encompasses the Apache Spark ecosystem as well as uh, the general Python data science stack and more recently you know, machine le uh, deep learning frameworks. Um, and there's a couple of uh, projects that we've released, the Model Asset Exchange and the Fabric for Deep Learning, uh, which I mentioned there. So I encourage you to go check out codea.org to find out more about those projects. So today we'll talk about model tuning uh, and cross-validation in Spark um, and what are some of the ways that we can scale that up and make it more performant and efficient. Uh, as well as the performance results uh, from that parallel, parallelis uh, parallelization uh, process. Uh, some of the best practices for, for doing that uh, in your Spark uh, cluster. Um, and then Brian's gonna talk about the future directions in, in uh, adding further optimizations to this work. So this is the machine learning workflow that we all know and love. Um, and you know, while sadly we probably spend most of our time as data scientists and machine learning researchers and engineers, uh, on the left-hand side of that, uh, of that workflow with data processing and you know, clean, cleansing data and processing it, um, we would really like to spend most of our time in model selection and, uh, and playing around with you know, the latest, greatest algorithms and finding out which one of them uh, work best on our data set. So fortunately for all of us today, that is where we're gonna focus. So that model selection uh, workflow is really uh, a workflow within a workflow, or a loop within a workflow. And that's the process of uh, evaluating, you know, taking candidate models, um, evaluating them you know, by training them, um, and trying to understand how they uh, might perform uh, in the real world. Uh, and then you know, adjusting our candidates. So whether that, that might be uh, looking at different parameter sets or trying out different pipelines, or uh, different algorithms entirely. And then at the end, you know, we select the best one, and that is the final model that we want to deploy uh, to our production system. So the way that we normally do this as practitioners is, you know, as, uh, probably as you know, cross-validation. Um, and cross-validation is about trying to determine what is going to be the performance of a machine learning model uh, on unseen data. And typically the way we do this is to split the data set. Uh, so in the simplest case, we might split it into a training data set and an evaluation data set. We train our model on the training data set, uh, evaluate it based on some you know, machine learning metric uh, on the evaluation set. And that'll give us an idea about how it's gonna perform uh, when, we, when it experiences some completely unseen data. So Spark uh, has all of this built in, whether you're using you know, uh, the training and validation split, the simple one that we, that we mentioned, or more complex k-fold cross-validation. And what's nice about Spark is that you know, uh, we can operate in, on, uh, on pipelines and we can do cross-validation across entire pipelines and not just models. So this example Spark pipeline here is, uh, is for a, a simple um, you know, text classifier. So we might have a tokenizer, a count vectorizer for uh, vectorizing the, the terms into, uh, into bag of word vectors and a logistic regression classifier. And in a typical cross-validation scenario, we might want to try out a, a few different parameter settings to figure out which one is going to perform the best. So 
these might be uh, you know, the size of the vocabulary for our vectorizer step um, and regularization for our machine learning model. So Spark allows us to, to, to uh, throw into that cross-validation this entire pipeline and treat it as one model that just gets uh, fit and evaluated as if it was you know, one a standalone machine learning model. Uh, and the way that, that uh, typically we will do this in, in most frameworks and certainly in Spark is to do grid search. So for every combination of these parameters, um, we create an, a, a unique pipeline with those parameter settings for each uh, individual uh, component. And we're going to evaluate, uh, train and evaluate uh, for each of those pipelines. So in this case, we've got uh, two sets of parameters with two settings each. Uh, and that creates four different combinations, uh, unique combinations of parameters. And we can see there that the tokenizer never changes, as that has no parameters that we're trying to tune. Uh, but the other two um, you know, will, will, be, uh, have, you know, will, will have that components uh, set in that, in that particular pipeline. So as I said, Spark makes this really nice and easy for us. So there's the, the kind of Spark equivalent code uh, in Scala. We can create this uh, pipeline from uh, the Spark ML components, um, and then we, we provide it with an, a nice convenience class called the Param Grid Builder. And all we have to do to that is uh, pass in these raw parameter settings that we, we want, um, and it'll build a parameter grid for us automatically. So we don't have to go and do that manually, which can be pretty intensive as we scale up to more and more parameters. Um, and then we've got a cross-validator class. Uh, and what's nice here is we can set the estimator to that class. So, and that estimator uh, doesn't have to just be a, a machine learning model. Because of uh, Spark ML pipelines, we can set that estimator to be the pipeline. Um, and cross -validation will ha the cross-validator will handle training and evaluation across that entire pipeline uh, for each parameter grid setting. So under the hood, this is kind of what the core code looks like. Uh, so, in, this is the case of k fold cross validation. So, first we'll split the data into these uh, k folds, maybe five folds in a typical case. Um, and for each uh, split or for each fold, we then have a, a training data set, which is, let's say, four out of the five um, or 80% of the, the, the data, um, and the validation set, which will be, let's say, 20% of the data. Um, and for each split, we're going to first uh, fit that estimator. So, in this case, uh, think about fitting that entire pipeline um, with a set of parameter, uh, per, uh, parameter maps that our param grid builder has created. And on, once we have a model, or a sequence of models in this case, uh, for each of those models, we're going to evaluate it on the, the, uh, the validation data set, um, and we, we're going to record the metric. Uh, and at the end, we, we will average the metric across each of the folds, and that gives us our cross-validation metric from which we can select the best model. So this is, uh, this is great, and it makes our life very easy, and um, you know, the API is nice and neat. But the problem is, cross-validation is really expensive. So we saw a simple example with four different parameter settings, but you, know, you can imagine uh, if you have uh, if it's only three components in your pipeline, each of which have five parameter settings, that quickly becomes 125 pipelines. And if you want to try, for example, four machine learning models, uh, you suddenly have to evaluate 500 pipelines. And this can grow pretty rapidly. So if the training and evalu evaluation processes and steps are not fully utilizing your cluster resources, then you're going to compound this waste for each of the 500 models. And you, you, you know, you, you're leaving a lot of uh, compute on the table. So how do we scale this process um, and make our lives easier and make our lives more efficient? Um, even though I know we all have coffee and uh, the excuse to go for, uh, for coffee break, um, those coffee breaks turn out to be too long uh, and we might be jumping off, the, you know, bouncing off the wall. So we don't want to spend too much time away. Um, and we also want to scale this process and make it faster uh, because of data scientists' time, right? I mean, that is really a valuable resource. And we would like to have fast iteration on our experiments and that, that you know, model selection loop. So probably the, the, the kind of most obvious way of uh, looking at this is to think about making this a parallel process. So 
let's say we want to evaluate two parameter settings in parallel, we can, we can do you know, the, the top two pipelines first. So setting features to be 10, and then the, the two different combinations of the regularization parameter. And then likewise, we can uh, do the same thing, setting features to 100 and uh, checking the, uh, and evaluating the two combinations of the reg param. And at the end, we've done exactly the same amount of work, and uh, we've done it hopefully twice as fast, and it's embarrass embarrassingly parallel. And this is exactly what has been added into Spark recently um, for both ScalaSide and PySpark. Um, and it's governed by a simple parallelism parameter, which just tells you the maximum number of models uh, which can be trained at once. So all you have to do from a user perspective uh, is change one little thing, which is just set that parameter to the appropriate value, um, and you get speed up for free. So under the hood, it looks very similar to what we saw before, uh, but over here we're going to be using uh, you know, futures and a, an execution context, uh, a thread pool effectively. And within the future, uh, the kind of asynchronous um, computation that we're going to be doing is to, to fit that estimator uh, on the, the given parameter map uh, and evaluate it. And these can be kicked off, um, as I said, asynchronously uh, and as, as uh, tasks become available uh, and slots in the, in the schedule become available in Spark, they get executed, and that's where we get you know, the, the, per, the level of parallelism and cluster utilization. Uh, it's worth pointing out that this is done per fold. Uh, so each fold is, is uh, trained and evaluated, and then you move on to the next fold. So some of the uh, implementation considerations around this uh, as I said, this, this parameter for parallelism sets the size of the thread pool under the hood. So it's effectively the maximum number of models that can be executed at once. Uh, we use a dedicated execution context to avoid locking up um, you know, environments if using the default thread pool. And this is a particularly uh, important for, for kind of notebook environments um, and shared user environments. Uh, we, we, we certainly looked at using uh, parallel collections for this, but it turns out that futures are just uh, a little bit more flexible. And this is uh, even more important later, uh, later on, or became more important later on, uh, because there's a lot more happening under the, you know, in that under the hood code than just the model evaluation. Uh, the, the feature was also added to be able to save uh, all the models, not just the best model, um, and that logic works, you know, can't really be um, expressed using parallel collections. Okay, so Brian's gonna take you through some of the performance tests that, that, uh, that he's run as part of this work. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. So we ran some performance tests to compare parallel CV to the standard serial cross-validation on a Spark standalone cluster that had 30 cores. We set up a number of data partitions to be 10 with the parallelism parameter to be three. And we made a grid size of our uh, parameters of 12. And then we measured the last elapsed time to complete cross-validation while we varied the data set size from 100,000 to 5 million. So our results showed about a 2.4 time speed up, and that remained pretty consistent throughout uh, as the data size increased. Um, we didn't quite reach uh, our parallelism of three, but we got pretty close. Uh, and that's probably due to uh, some additional overhead in the whole process. So some of the best practices you can uh, apply when using this in production is that uh, one issue is that the, there's only a simple integer that you set with this parameter. So it kind of makes it a little bit difficult. If you set it too low, you might underutilize your cluster. If you set it too high, you might end up overloading things and running into memory issues. So maybe a rough rule, if you know the number of cores you have available, the number of data partitions, you can simply uh, divide those and come up with a number, but it really depends on other things as well, such as your data size and models. Um, a good rule of thumb is maybe uh, for a mid-sized cluster, just to set a value uh, no more than 10.
Okay, now I'm gonna talk about some ongoing work that we've been doing for optimizing this tuning for pipeline models. Most likely your real world pipelines are gonna be um, a lot more than just a couple stages and they'll probably be pretty complex. You'll also most likely have a parameter grid containing hyperparameters from more than one stage. So with all this, it's easy to have a huge number of possible parameter combinations and a large number of models that you need to evaluate. Now, our model parallelism can help, but we can actually do more optimizations on these pipelines to do even better. So Spark currently treats each pipeline completely independently. And this works great for model parallelism because they can all run uh, asynchronously. But uh, it ends up creating a lot of extra duplicated work. Um, and so depending on how you set up your parameter grid and your pipeline stages, you might end up fitting the same model more than once and doing the same kind of transformations over and over again. So with our simple example here of our three stages of tokenizer, count vectorizer, and logistic regressions, we have a parameter grid with two parameters from count vectorizer, two parameters from logistic regression. So we have a total of four pipelines we need to evaluate. And you'll notice that we end up repeating the tokenizer transform all four times. We're gonna to need to train two count vectorizer models and we end up training each one twice. And uh, we do all this in order to evaluate our logistic regression models. So a better way to represent this is as a graph in the form of a tree. And here, each node represents an estimator or transformer with a specific set of hyperparameters. A path in the tree from the root to a leaf represents a single pipeline model. I'll walk through a sample uh, execution of how this would run doing a cross-validation. And here we'll set the parallelism parameter to two. We'll begin execution in a breadth first order, and we will only queue tasks when uh, action is performed on the data set. So initially our tokenizer is just a transform, and we'll begin with for fitting the first two count vectorizer nodes. <clears throat> Once a count vectorizer model is Fit is trained, we can cache the result of that transform in order to reuse that throughout both logistic regression models. So we'll cache that and proceed to fit logistic regression on the first two. And then we will do the same to uh, fit the next two. Once a node that's cached has all its children nodes complete, then we can then unpersist that that data frame, and we'll do the same to finally fit all four logistic regression models. And at this point, we have everything fitted, we've done the same amount of work, and uh, we've unpersisted the remaining of the data. Next, we'll begin to evaluate these models, and evaluation uses a similar method, only now count vectorizer is just a transform. So we'll begin by immediately evaluating the logistic regression models, and we can, again, reuse our uh, cache result from count vectorizer model to save us on some transforms. After evaluation, we get a metric to see how the model did, and we do the same on our next count vectorizer and proceed to uh, evaluate the final two logistic regression models. At the end, we have evaluated all the models for this fold, and we need to complete this for all the folds in our cross-validation to compute average metrics. Once that's complete, then we can look and find the best model, which is highlighted in green. Okay, we ran some performance tests again with this, and we compared this time uh, to the Spark standard cross-validation with parallelism enabled as well. So we had parallelism set to three. We performed the test in the same Spark standalone cluster with 30 cores. This time we fixed the size of the data set and instead we 
uh, increase the number of models in the parameter grid from 36 to 80, and we measure the lapse time to complete cross-validation. Our results showed uh, up to a 3.25 times speed up, and it increased as, the more, as more and more models were added to the parameter grid. So an important takeaway is that as your parameter grid increases and your pipeline becomes more and more complex, this is just gonna work better. But uh, the one caveat is that it introduces extra caching of your data, so you have to be careful on how you set your parameter of uh, parallelism along with how much data is actually gonna be cached. Uh, the code I used to run this benchmark, it's available uh, at the link below. It's uh, currently implemented in Python and for PySpark, and it's working, but still in an experimental stage. If you're interested in this kind of work, uh, please follow the JIRA that's at Spark 19071, and we can, uh, uh, you can track the progress through there. Back to Nick. Thanks, Brian. So, so um, that, uh, th this work has all been done uh, by Brian, so you know, uh, we're really uh, glad that, uh, that he was able to do that. And we'd, we'd like to try and definitely get uh, this, uh, you know, this optimized tuning for pipeline models into Spark Core. So, that wraps up uh, the talk. I'll just uh, I really encourage you to uh, go check out codeair.org. Um, and in particular, there's a, there's a couple of uh, projects that I mentioned. Um, the Fabric for Deep Learning, uh, or FIDDLE, which is a Kubernetes-based uh, deep learning framework that allows you to train uh, various frameworks, so TensorFlow, uh, Keras, Cafe, PyTorch, um, on your own Kubernetes cluster or on, you know, on a cloud provider. And uh, Max, which is the Model Asset Exchange. Um, and uh, Max is a one-stop shop uh, one-stop location for uh, developers to uh, find, uh, train, and deploy open and uh, research deep learning models. So it's a very young project, uh, you know, fairly recently uh, launched, and we're working to, to expand that, but I encourage you to go and check those out. Um, and finally, uh, th there's uh, a bunch of IBM sessions um, at the summit, which, uh, which I encourage you to go check out. Uh, I'll be talking tomorrow about deep learning for recommender systems in the afternoon, and Brian will be uh, co-leading a Birds of a Feather session on um, Apache Arrow in Spark. Great, so thanks very much. Um, and we'd like to take a few questions. Uh, please use the mic. Uh, there's a couple of mics uh, if you have questions. So just to repeat the question um, for those that couldn't hear, uh, the question is whether the, uh, the, uh, the DAG optimization for the pipelines is applicable only to different parameter settings or uh, kind of more, more generically uh, can, can kind of do some smart stuff about uh, shared uh, parent, uh, parent transformations or components, right? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it was written specifically for uh, parameter grid usage, but uh, I, I think the same kind of uh, thing could be applied to uh, other aspects as well. Um, probably just take a little different uh, tuning, but um, I think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I think in particular it would be interesting to, uh, to have, uh, to take a look at whether it can be applied to, um, you know, different pipelines where the, where the final stage of the pipeline is a different estimator, uh, and most of the preceding stages are, are shared and common. At the moment, that requires you know, different pipelines. Uh, you know, if you want to evaluate logistic regression versus um, you know, decision tree versus whatever else, 
So I think that that, that could be a, a way to, to combine the, the shared, you know, the, the, the hyperparameter optimization uh, part, you know, component of it with the shared um, kind of parents or preceding uh, kind of sub-components of the pipeline. Yeah, so the, the question is around how our resources is managed uh, in this parallel uh, cross-validator effectively. Uh, so you know, the, the resources are effectively managed by, by Spark itself. Um, so if you just launch the tasks, Spark will kind of take care of it. But, um, but you do have to be careful. So uh, as Brian mentioned on the best practices, uh, you know, if you increase that level of parallelism too much, uh, you might run into issues, particularly with, with memory. Um, so if you, if you size the, the, the parallelism parameter correctly for your, for your cluster, uh, you shouldn't have a problem with the number of kind of concurrent tasks that are running, um, but you might run into issues with, uh, with memory resources. Um, so specifically, uh, there's a lot of caching of data sets that happens, obviously, as you saw, you know, you, you cache the, the training and then the evaluation data set, um, and they can only really be unpersisted after that, that features task is completed. Uh, so you might have a lot of data cached at the same time. Uh, so if you've got a huge amount of data, uh, that's going to impact the, the level of parallelism that you can have. Um, and then uh, uh, the other thing is model size. So at most, uh, you're going to have you know, the, the parallelism level P, uh, number of models in memory at once. Uh, and if you've got very large models, that obviously takes up significant resources on the workers. So uh, as your data size and model size, you know, dimensionality of your if your data set effectively increases, uh, you, you, you're naturally going to have to scale back the level of parallelism and concurrency that you can have. Uh, at the moment, that's purely heuristic based. So you kind of have to uh, run it a few times or run it with different settings and see how, how the scalability works. There's no kind of automation around that. Um, but that would be ideal to kind of try to uh, gauge the you know, available resources, estimate the size of the model and, and cache data and you know, tune, tune that together with the cause, cause and number of partitions calculation. Hi. Uh, yeah. uh, just wondering, so uh, is the parallelism already available in 2.3 or not yet? Uh, Spark 2.3. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? The parallelism feature that you showed earlier, um, is it already available in Spark 2.3 or it's just been committed? Yeah, the, the first half of the presentation dealing with the parallelism parameter is available. So uh, okay. that, that's in Spark 2.3. And um, uh, just the second part that optimizes right. pipelines uh, is still in the works. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Hmm? So, Spark R? Oh. Uh, not, not to my knowledge. No. Uh, uh, because it, uh, at the moment, there's a... Uh, this, the Scala and Python cross-validators are actually um, kind of completely separate classes. I mean, uh, generally PySpark is calling into a, a, the Scala kind of uh, implementation of the ML components, but for cross, the cross-validator, it's written in pure Python. So this was implemented separately for Scala and Python, uh, and it's not in R at the moment. Right. So is it in Scala then? For Scala the, and Python. For the doc, right. the day though? Um, good question. I, I don't actually know off the top of my head. Uh, I think it probably is, uh, but I, I couldn't tell you a uh, JIRA number or anything like that. I know pipelines themselves are not really fully supported in R, uh, so that might have to come first. Uh, but for simple cross-validation, uh, I mean, it, it probably is on the roadmap, but to be honest, uh, neither of us work very closely in, in the R side of things, so I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Thanks for all the work. I mean, just, just curious if I missed this. Um, 
did you say that it parallelizes all the folds all at once, or is it, you know, does it, does it only parallelize each and every parameter of the grid? Or, like for example, if you're doing five folds, are all the folds also parallelized? Uh, <clears throat> no, it ends up uh, synchronizing uh, after each fold. Okay. So uh, it, it's running the models parallel within the fold, and then syncs up, and then uh, same with the next fold. So yeah. Okay. It's not fully asynchronous. Okay. It's a trade-off uh, again about resource utilization. So if you parallel, it's certainly possible to do it across folds all at the same time, but then you end up uh, caching, you know, obviously right. five copies or ten copies of the data, which uh, which is probably going to be uh, too much in many cases. So that, that was the decision was, was to try and you know, to decide on uh, the fold as the kind of bound, you know, synchronization boundary and then parallelize within each fold. Okay. I mean, then did you guys cons did you guys consider doing it like setting up the parallelism parameter like um, how S you know Scikit Learn does it by setting n jobs as minus one? So you know you could is there a way to look at how the Spark context is set up in terms of resources and a lot and automatically figure out appropriate parallelism? Um, yeah, I think that's you know kind of a goal for the future, um, and so we kind of set up uh, uh, the parallelism as a trait that could be a little bit more flexible to allow different kinds of execution contexts, and uh, so hopefully we can extend that execution context to be kind of managed by you know some uh, aspect of Spark that you know is aware of the available resources and can set it accordingly. So um, hopefully in the future. Sure. Thanks for all the work, though. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.